Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus Behold this heart which is so inflamed for men. With these words our Lord in 1673 appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alico to ask for devotion to his Sacred Heart. The mystery is that Jesus, God himself, would so need the love of mere mortal man that he actually came to earth to ask us to reciprocate his great love for us. But it's not all mystery. If you loved me so much that in torture you shed every drop of blood on my behalf, well, imagine if in spite of that I was cold, indifferent, and even insulting to you. Jesus' love for each of us, and I stress each of us, is measured by every drop of his blood slowly and agonizingly shed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, can we comprehend a mental torment so intense as to cause a sweat of blood? And this was caused less from dread of the morrow than from the crushing knowledge that many for whom he would suffer would not even thank him and would lose their souls despite it all. This foreknowledge of the futility of his terrible sufferings for so many forced the blood through the pores of his skin. A question arises, why did Jesus wait sixteen centuries before he came down to ask us to reciprocate his love? And the answer must be that for most of the sixteen centuries he didn't need to ask. For the first few hundred years, the church was full of Christians whose love for Christ was heroic as they laid down their lives in the great persecutions. In the following centuries, as the church grew and spread, as it moulded in Europe the finest culture the earth has ever seen, in those centuries, love of Christ was the centre point of a Christian's life. Love of Christ was the mark of the Christian when the Christian culture reached its period of splendor in the Middle Ages. In all those centuries, Christ had no need to come to earth to plead for a little love. Then there happened a series of extraordinary happenings which weakened and almost destroyed the fabric of Christian society. First came the fearful plague called the Black Death. In two years, in two short years, from 1348 to 1350, in those two short years the Black Death killed at least one-third, and possibly a half, of the total population of Western Europe. The shock and the results were horrific. Europe was never the same again. Then, just after the Black Death, came the second happening. And this was the great schism inside the church, when there were two popes, the true pope in Rome and a rival pope at Avignon in France, with half of Europe supporting Rome and the other half supporting Avignon. This scandal went on for 40 years, from 1377 to 1417, when Martin V was elected undisputed pope. Now, even while the great schism was on, the third of the happenings was beginning, and this was what has been called the Renaissance. The Renaissance was a rebirth or revival in Europe of art and literature and philosophy, a revival based on a rediscovery of the classic works of ancient cultures, particularly of Greece. When Constantinople fell to the Turks in 1453, Many Greek scholars fled to Italy, bringing with them masses of classic manuscripts. This gave further impetus to what had already begun, namely a revolution of the mind, a new outlook of the mind of European man. Under a surge of new learning, new art, new philosophy, European man was off balance, and the sudden new knowledge brought an intellectual pride 
which exalted the old pagan culture but scorned the medieval Christian culture. The newfound knowledge was good in itself, provided it was used wisely. Unfortunately, human perversity turned it, to a great extent, against the Christian ethos, so that while the Renaissance brought forth a new magnificence in art and letters, it also caused a change in outlook on life, a change in outlook on religion, on philosophy, on economics, on science. It produced a new scepticism and a pride in the humanism that scoffed at dogma. These side effects of the Renaissance weakened the unity of the Catholic culture that bound Europe, especially the unity of religious thought and morals. And then the spirit of the age infected the church itself. The papal court became too rich and too much Italian instead of universal. In this period, a few of the popes were worldly, though yet good enough, not really bad popes, but one pope, Alexander VI, who ruled at the turn of the century was a scandal, and his reign damaged the papacy itself in the eyes of men. Furthermore, many of the clergy had become worldly and even lax in morals. Then came the unfortunate drive for money for building St. Peter's by methods which seemed to be sales of indulgences. Resentment against the papacy and the clergy grew amongst ordinary Catholics, while among the wealthy and the nobles, greed to grab church property was growing. So by the early 1500s, the old order was ready for explosion. The explosion came. It came with what seemed an unimportant protest by Luther, but it grew, and soon it carried Luther along with it. So began what is called the Reformation, which engulfed all Christendom with intense hatred of the old faith, which produced uprisings and civil wars, and which finally left Christians deeply divided into Catholic and Protestant and into the present fragmentation of what was once united Christendom. It brought widespread loss of Catholic faith, brought hatred for the Pope and the Mass, and rejection of the Eucharist, and many Catholic devotions and sacraments. Perhaps now we start to see why Jesus then came to earth after 16 centuries. A new spirit was abroad, and the old love for him was yielding to indifference, to coldness, and even worse to come, in the great modern revolts against the Church, starting with the French Revolution. Thus was the stage set when Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alico in a series of visions from 1673 to 1675. At the age of 21, Margaret Mary had entered the Order of the Visitation Nuns at paray le monial in France. She had an ardent devotion to Mary and an intense devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and to our Lord's Passion. Margaret Mary had much to suffer in the convent from the rebukes and ridicule of the other nuns who resented her spirituality, and she suffered many humiliations with patience and charity. In this way was she prepared for Jesus' coming. One day, while she was praying before the Blessed Sacrament, Jesus appeared to her and spoke, Behold my heart, which is so inflamed with love for men that it has spared nothing in exhausting itself in proof of its love. But instead of gratitude, I receive from most only indifference, irreverence, sacrilege, coldness and scorn. In those words I always see the wonder of the ages, Almighty God seeking love from the creatures he created. For the next eighteen months 
Jesus frequently appeared to Margaret Mary, showing her his heart, sometimes burning as a furnace, sometimes torn and bleeding, sometimes surrounded by a crown of thorns. Finally, he revealed that she, together with a Jesuit priest, Father de la Colombière, would be the chief instrument for instituting the Feast of the Sacred Heart and for spreading that devotion throughout the world. Now here was she, an obscure nun in an enclosed convent. How could she convert the world to this devotion? Father de Colombier was the confessor to the nuns. Margaret confided to him the visions and the command to spread the devotion. The priest was cautious. He took his time, tested her sincerity. Finally, he became convinced, and then he became the great champion, preaching the new devotion far and wide. Soon, within the convent, the old resentment of the nuns changed to a fervent devotion. And outside in the world, despite opposition from Jansenists, Despite opposition from lax Catholics and skeptics, the devotion steadily took hold. A century later, support came from several bishops and, most of all, from Pope Pius VI, who, you recall, was the first pope imprisoned by Napoleon. And a century later still, Pope Leo XIII, in 1899, consecrated the human race to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Now to those who are devoted to his sacred heart, Jesus was lavish with his promises. Twelve promises he made. Listen to them one by one. To those who are devoted to his sacred heart. One, I will give them all the graces necessary in their state of life. Two, I will establish peace in their homes. Three, I will comfort them in all their afflictions. Four, I will be their secure refuge during life and above all in death. Five, I will bestow abundant blessings on all their undertakings. Six, sinners will find in my heart the source and the infinite ocean of mercy. Seven, by devotion to my heart, tepid souls will grow fervent. Eight, Fervent souls will quickly mount to high perfection. Nine, and specially note nine, I will bless every place where a picture of my heart shall be set up and honoured. Don't forget, honoured. Ten, I will give to priests the gift of touching the most hardened hearts. Eleven, those who promote this devotion shall have their names written in my heart, never to be blotted out. Twelve, I will grant the grace of final penitence to those who receive Holy Communion on the first Friday of nine consecutive months. In other words, receive Communion on nine first Fridays in reparation to the Sacred Heart and heaven is yours. Three things he wants of us. Promote devotion to the Sacred Heart. Frequent communion, especially on First Fridays. Set up a picture of the Sacred Heart in the home and honour it. Don't forget to honour it. The modern world is full of haters of Christ. But worse than the haters are the millions who are neither hot nor cold, who neither love nor hate. The many, the very many, who break the sacred heart by indifference, by worldliness, by fashionable contempt, even by casual blasphemy of his name. The few must make up for the many. One aspiration of love for Jesus compensates for many blasphemies. The few must love heroically. Jesus, when his three hours were run, bequeathed thee from
from the cross to me.